So we started 13 hours ago uh, this morning, <clears throat> and I'm either a dessert or the bitter end. Thank you all for staying with it. Uh, it's the Macy's, this one down here. Uh, and it, uh, so my, my talk uh, is at the, uh, as Monty Python would say, uh, something completely different. So we're gonna talk about the clinical genome sequencing at scale end of the spectrum and future genomic uh, medicine for a few minutes um, and uh, address the issue of how we represent what we learn and what it means in terms of actionable uh, uh, things that can be done in a clinical setting, uh, specifically to support learning healthcare systems, and that was a topic that came up in this afternoon session quite a bit. So just to remind you, if you're not a clinician, this is how DNA results currently get re uh, reported into clinical settings. This is one of my favorites because not only it was a PDF printed uh, on a printer, but it was then faxed. So it's a set of black and white dots that only a human being that can read English would know how to decipher. Um, here's a more fancy color up-to-date version of the same problem <laughs> where, our, uh, where we do large high, high throughput uh, complex uh, screens and then we report a bunch of words on a piece of paper electronically. So. What I would submit, and this topic is about, is that what you can, if you wish to ensure that genomic medicine will have little or no impact in healthcare, you do it in such a way that you rely on clinicians reading and remembering both clinical reports and a published literature that is completely out of scale for anyone to keep up, even a specialist, but, but certainly not uh, the non-specialist. So what are the problems of treating genomic analysis the same fashion as other professionally interpreted data? So for example, x-ray data comes as some technology generates a picture and then you get a professional interpretation of it. Well, so in this era of, uh, and this arena of, of DNA and genomes, you're doing what informatics people call lossy compression. That is, you reduce things by throwing away data that you cannot then reconstruct. So you observe a lot of DNA features, you report only a few clinically relevant ones, um, and you either keep for your own research or you throw away the rest of them. The, in the interpretation is itself inextricably bound together with the primary observations in a document format, and that format is not amenable, however good a computer person you might be, to taking it apart for purposes of being able to do automated machine interpretation of what's in the document or decision support. And the big one here uh, that has informed everything we've talked about today and that obviously genome science is, is an area where a lot more is unknown than we expect to be known over, over the coming months and years, if not centuries. And the science is changing rapidly. Um, almost uh, three, three years to this week, there was a NH uh, I, uh, or a, a, a National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute meeting on incorporating genomic data into electronic medical records. Several people in, the room, in this room were co-authors on this manuscript of, of technical desiderata for how you should get this data into clinical systems. And there were seven of them. The first is to, you do need to be able to sort of dehydrate this data and get it smaller because a lot of it's highly redundant. But you need to do that in a way that is, causes lossless data uh, compression so you can rehydrate it, so to speak. We know that the methods are changing constantly, so the lab results have to carry with them the methods by which they were derived, since there are no perfect uh, methods and they all have sort of blind spots. Uh, it's clear as well we need compact representation, representation of clinical actionable subsets. The informatics literature tells us that the average clinician takes about one quarter of a section to get the next idea when they see something on the screen in a clinical workstation. We need to simultaneously support both human viewable and readable formats with links to interpretation for non-specialists and formats that are interpreted by decision support rules. We need to separate the primary sequence data, which presumably remains true if it's accurate as a laboratory observation from the clinical interpretations that would be expected to change with a rapidly changing science. Anticipate the boundless creativity of nature. Maybe you know the, <laughs> the germline genome's not quite as stable as we thought it was, and that we actually have multiple genomes, both somatic and germline, over our lifetimes. And lastly, in this area, support both individual healthcare and the discovery science that we talked about. So all seven of these uh, desiderata are failed by a PDF. Let's focus on one in particular, this support for both human viewable formats and interpretation by decision support rules. 
So here's the opportunity for NHGRI. And it is this idea that along the way of, of building the knowledge base about clinically relevant molecular variation is to create a scalable national capacity for genomically enabled clinical decision support and do it in a, in a way that's actually quite unlike most decision support has been done for the last uh, three decades. And that is to support creation of a Wikipedia-like, Wikipedia -like, and, and I've emphasized closed loop, I'll tell you what I mean by that, computing infrastructure for guiding clinical care based on variation. That has the structural property of improving whether or not the clinicians accept the advice. Cool idea, I think. And it's something where the data actually becomes the, the instrument of improving the system rather than the judgment of the people that use the data. Now, before we get too far down this path, whenever um, computer people talk about rule-based systems, certain fraction of clinicians uh, go in, uh, hit, hit the ceiling. Because rule-based systems don't mean providers need to follow rules. What rules are in a bioinformatics context is a, a systematic computerized approach to identifying a set of characteristics, and if they are present, then doing something. So examples of clinical interventions could include educational prompts that might occur when uh, a, a clinician who doesn't know the literature happens to see a patient who has a, a genomic variant. They could be data gathering prompts that says, given what is known about this patient, if you get this additional testing, uh, it would improve um, the, the management. You could improve the certainty of diagnosis given the data currently available. And then the next case is the one most everybody thinks of, that is give a, a drug or modify its dose based on something about the molecular variation or just give information relative to prevention and prognosis. So all of those are the spectrum of things that could happen when the decision support rules fire. Here's an example of a patient-specific decision support application. It's been up and running since, 19, since 2010 uh, at Vanderbilt, and so it's a pharmacogenomics uh, 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 app that has behind it uh, what uh, clinical informatics people call event monitors. That's a computer program that just spends its whole day looking to see whether something has just happened in the real world, such as a prescriber wishing to prescribe this drug, uh, uh, clopidogrel, um, for someone who is sitting across uh, from them in the exam room. Unbeknownst to them, the patient actually had, has been genotyped and does have a genotype that, uh, for which it is relevant that they're known to be a, a potentially a, a, a poor metabolizer of this drug. So up pops and a little alert uh, that, that gives um, a straightforward way of solving the problem, or you can override it if you wish. But this did not require that that clinician either read the literature or even understand what uh, a haplotype or a genome or a SNP was. How do you go about doing this? So the building blocks of this infrastructure, kind of in a Lego block mode, uh, that NHGRI could very much uh, advance would be development of the standards for what I would call decision support packages. They have three elements to them. The first is the recognition logic for phenotype, genotype, or both. Uh, that means something is in the space for which there is guidance available. This is uh, the kind of work that eMERGE and the other uh, consortia have been doing over the last five to seven years. The second element is, well, when that rule is satisfied, what do you do next? Who, who gets the message and what's the message or what, what do you re, uh, what's the guidance for the target users? Doesn't have to just be clinicians, could be patients or families. And then the important closed loop is another set of recognition logic. When the top of the rule fires, that activates the rest of the rule to watch for something happening in the future that represents either a good or a bad outcome or a particular process or outcome variable um, that is measurable and observable. Uh, and then that needs to be combined with uh, ways that mere mortals can use these, authoring systems that could import these rules so that people can understand what the effects would be in order to implement them in their electronic medical record system. That needs to be linked at probably a national level, if not, if not an international level, to a public library of decision support packages of this type that could be thought of as a Wikipedia uh, where you have contributing um, uh, experience, uh, real-world experience doing this by lots of healthcare systems. 
The event monitors are a necessary component, but it turns out they're actually required by the new federal incentives for having electronic medical records. So the engines are there. You just need to run the program through the engine. You have these system generator alert, uh, generated alerts at the teachable moment. And then, importantly, you close the loop by automated tracking, and that gives you a learning healthcare system that is driven by the data. Now, well, how do you get the data back? I would propose that the way you do it is have a simple quid pro quo, which is if you use the public library and you download it, you do it with an agreement that you will subsequently monitor you know, use that same event monitor to look for the downstream effects of, of whether the guidance was accepted or rejected by the individual clinicians. And then you don't have to upload every single, uh, you know, it's not a HIPAA issue. You could upload the aggregate local outcomes. And as you gather the experience of institutions having their own experience across dozens, hundreds, perhaps thousands of patients, then you get a true learning healthcare system that's driven uh, and basically learns from every single decision support event whether or not <laughs> anybody paid attention to the guidance that was recommended. So uh, to echo uh, at the end of the day, Eric's opening of the day, why? Well, it fits the strategic plan. It would, it's resource generating. It would certainly advance the technology. It's, it's clearly scientifically and me medically relevant. And it is a, a natural consortium requiring opportunity. It certainly fits this complex, high-volume, evolving science you know, of genomics, where we expect five years from now, the views of the importance of these variants is going to change quite a bit. It certainly would make an NHGRI a trailblazer. And it's the, op it's the observation in clinical arena that although the driving spear would be genomics, that if this really works, they'll start using it for all kinds of much more mundane clinical care to systematize and learn from uh, provider behaviors. Uh, it's important to start now because this is a big uh, project. It would take many years to scale up to full adoption. So it really needs to start as prototypes and then to uh, meet uh, Eric's last point, uh, it's something you're not doing now, so Gordon, you should be doing it. <laughs> so um, with that, I think you know, what it recognizes is this, um, the fundamental truth of this cartoon, not to scale, but it, was, uh, it has some sensibility to it since it's appeared in IOM reports and such, that as you have um, structural and functional genetics and proteomics you get an awful lot more facts that bear on any particular clinical decision in a kind of stutter stuff fashion that exceeds this long known human and cognitive capacity of, of uh, uh, people's ability to deal with maybe five to seven covariates and after that they just start extinguishing variables in order to keep problems simple. And so it's clearly, uh, nobody knows if it's 100 facts or 10 or 1,000, but it doesn't really matter because it's above the bounds where people can read and remember and do the right thing and only the right thing and do it every single time as we would like to do in 21st century healthcare. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Ah, 95 mile an hour fastball. <laughs> I think one of the profound things that uh, has happened in surgery is the adoption of checklists that came from the medical community consulting with the aviation community. As a pilot, I will tell you that if you're going to do this, you should do it like the FAA does because they deliver to pilots information of this range and complexity every day to safely transport millions of people. Yeah, so you're a pilot talking to another pilot, and I have the aviation version of the same talk. But I actually what I found is that the, P the FAA does this as a centralized database, and you're going to download it into your GPS nav unit and all that stuff. It's a wonderful model for them providing a, a source of, of uh, ground truth that then manufacturers of navigation computers put, make, make your airplane safe doing that. But there was a lot of feeling like, oh no, the federal government shouldn't own the rules. And so this one, you know, the, the FEA doesn't do it as a Wikipedia, but uh, it certainly is the case that this would constitute, in essence, healthcare autopilots that know, how, know a safe path. You can still override them because you're pilot in command. You have the authority to say, no, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to follow that guidance. But at least you'd have a default that was known to me, best practice uh, initiated. So it's. Yes. Dan? Dan? Yes. 
So I'm a big fan of clinical decision support, as you know. Uh, if I were Eric Green and listening to your talk, I would wonder to myself, how does this fit into Genome Institute? And is there some other funder, is there some other partner I can, I can find that will do this? Because it's sort of, it's a little bit outside genome science, but those of us in, you know, Im enmeshed or drowning in eMERGE will sort of attest to the sort of fundamental need for this kind of mm -hmm. capability, but it's, but it's not analyzing genomes. So, how, so how do you deal with that? Well, so I think that, that genomic medicine has this special uh, place of uh, awe and mystery among most clinicians, which is they don't understand it. They know it vaguely must be important, and they sure know it's complicated, and there are a lot of facts there. So NHGRI actually has the privilege of sort of building a platform infrastructure that actually could have been built for any aspect of healthcare. I mean, we, we're still operating on this Oslerian model that somehow the apogee of the profession is the learned professional. And there was way too much to know 25 years ago in a lot of arenas. It's just this is the one where everybody acknowledges everyone's a cognitive capacity is insufficient. So I think, in essence, it's that general awareness that this, this is the most complicated use case uh, for this that gives NHGRI both the, the mandate and, and I think the privilege of being able to advance it when other institutes would have a number of doctors who say, I'm smarter than your damn rules, I don't need them. Even though the literature says that we aren't as good as we think we are when we try to be consistent in the application of best practice. But Eric. just to follow up on that, in, in this domain, it may be wrapped in mystery and awe, but we don't actually know most of the answers. So wouldn't it be a good idea to do it someplace where they kind of knew the answers and there was a lot of data, nobody disagreed that if you knew the right thing, there were just too many things to keep track of, you could get it right. We're sort of figuring out this stuff along the way. There are variants of unknown significance everywhere, sure. combinations we don't know, and building a decision support system when we don't know the right decision might not be the best way to convince people. Oh, but I think that the fact that there is so much unknown of unknown significance uh, that is expected to become known over the ensuing decades is exactly the reason why you would build it here, because there's still, there's already enough data that is not widely appreciated by practitioners, even in just pharmacogenetics. So, uh, so, so I actually do think that there, this, that although you see it as the place where you wouldn't wish to start, I say that's exactly the reason why you'd start well, but, here, I mean, as just, opposed to a very mature area where people would say, but I already no, but, know no, these. But there are great diagnosticians, and then there are not so great diagnosticians with regard to internal medicine. And if you could get a decision support system that made a mediocre diagnostician into a vastly better diagnostician, mm -hmm. it would have huge impact. And well, you could imagine doing that today. Well, except there actually is a 35-year history of doing this with uh, systems like Onkison and Octo Barnett at MGH, uh, the DXplain system, at, which was published in the New England Journal in the late 80s, that it could perform as well as expert clinicians at, at, at grand rounds of the Mass General. And they've never taken hold. And the reason they don't take hold is, by and large, because they are kind of a threat to clinician autonomy who they believe they're actually smarter than the rules, and they sort of believe they're better at mature, managing mature bodies of knowledge than they are. Because human beings are really good at detecting patterns. They're not really good at working with long lists of interrelated things like drug-drug interactions, all that stuff. So this, I think, speaks to this fundamental human fallibility of our believing that we are more consistent and, more, and, and, and better than we actually are when we try to do something as complicated as this. And to br bring it back to aviation, they actually recognized this quite a long time ago because the, uh, you know, the classic here is the Tenerife accident, which was the world's most perfect pilot generated the worst air disaster in history. He was the chief of aviation safety for KLM, pushed the throttles forward and killed 500 and some people. And it, and it was because of human fallibility. And they realized that human beings can't basically be trusted with very, very complex bodies of knowledge. You've got to have some systems infrastructure to make them more reliable. All right. Uh, one, one more, and then I, well, think, I, I, I think I'm way overdone here. <laughs> Yeah. Never David. mind. I would just say as a clinician, 
I agree with Eric Lander that I think doing this in an area where we have no idea what the right answer is has the danger that all you'll get is a Wikipedia of opinions and that I'm not sure that that actually results in high quality medicine. And so I might, I agree with everything else you said except that it seems to me where there's an absence of data, I don't really see how crowdsourcing opinions gets us anything but who likes Instagram pictures but not actually high quality health Oh, but this isn't crowdsourcing opinion. This is crowdsourcing things that actually occurred. So, I mean, this is a set of observations that are systematically acquired. So the power is in the data, not necessarily in the interpretation of the data. Yes. Yeah. I do remember the days of Bison and all the, uh, the early rule-based systems uh, from the late 80s. And I think I would avoid the word rule-based because I think one of the problems there was the whole idea that the practice of medicine would be reduced to sure. rules. And, and I can understand why there was a clinician revolt back then, no matter how sure. good or not good the rules were. I think we can provide decision support without casting it as a rule-based Yeah, Yeah, and, that's, and I actually had that on the slide, that the rules actually re relate to the recognition of the scenario, not to the fact that you have to do something that represents a rule. It's just my opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, everyone, uh, for staying to the end. We will convene again at 8.30 tomorrow morning.